Welcome. Isn't this a crisp and sunny day for a program about warm and cozy quilts? I'm Gail Karwaski, and I'm a board member for Reflecting, Sharing, Learning, RSL, as our website starts, a programming series here at the library. Today's program begins with a slide presentation by Mary Walker from the Southeastern Quilt and Textile Museum. Following the slide presentation, please join us in the multi-purpose room A for our Antiques Roadshow style event. If you brought a quilt to be evaluated, you'll find someone at the door to help you. And while you're here, don't forget to visit the Heritage Room Quiet Gallery upstairs to see an exceptional collection of vintage quilts belonging to the members of the Cotton Patch Quilters. The Cotton Patch Quilters have been an indispensable component of our program today. They are one of the oldest art guilds in Athens, and they celebrate their 30th anniversary this year. Their large and active membership exhibits frequently, and they donate much of their raffle proceeds to charity. I want to especially mention Madeline Holly and Marilyn Osterkamp, who will introduce our speaker today. Marilyn, come on up here. Good afternoon. It's nice to see some old friends who came by to join us all. Today our speaker is Mary Walker. Mary Walker is now a, uh, on the board of the Southeastern Quilt and Textile Museum. She came to the museum from the Public History Department of West Georgia as an intern when we opened in 2012. She's just stayed on and stayed on and we won't let her go. She also volunteers and she's put together this wonderful program. Mary's always wanted to be a quilt historian. Her mother was a teacher in England of arts and design. After she retired from nursing, she, well, I'm changing backwards, here we go. She has done nothing, I've seen, go to school. She's <laughs> done nothing to go to school. She uh, studied Southern history at West Georgia, and she's, well, let's see, where else has she been? Uh, <laughs> Southern history oh, in West Georgia, and let me think. She's a visiting scholar of quilting, quilt studies at Lincoln, Nebraska, by the way, which is now the International Quilt Center. Uh, she is, as I, I paid attention, she also has a master's degree in adult education from UGA and, what did you do? And a professional writing, professional writing degree from Kennesaw. She has nothing to do with her time, of course. Uh, she is actually a book publisher. She's a terrific person, but she tells me she's a poor quilter, but we'll fix that. I know you'll enjoy what she has to tell you about our wonderful quilts, and please do remember that Southeastern Quilt and Textile Museum in, Col uh, in uh, Carrollton, Georgia is ours, so let's all enjoy it. I'm very happy to be here today. I was thrilled with the invitation. Uh, this is a wonderful facility, and I'm just so pleased to be able to share the museum with you all. Basically, I don't really want to bore you, you know, with the nonprofit and all the... I mean, you know, we, that will happen, obviously, uh, since we're a museum. But uh, I want to kind of give you a state of the museum uh, report in much the same way that the President gave us the State of the Union. Uh, message. We've been in existence for very, very little time beyond two years. And we've made some great strides in Carrollton because we've had huge support. Um, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this riddle at the end of the presentation, but I want to think about it. I want you to think about this. When is a museum like a quilt? And the easy answer is when it's a quilt museum, but that isn't the answer. <laughs> and as I told you, I was going to bore you with the details. We are a nonprofit, and we appreciate 
all the help we get from huge numbers of people. And we do belong to different organizations because this partnership and this sharing is very, very important in the uh, area of the museums in this day and time because funding has gotten to be extremely difficult. Our mission is collecting, exhibiting, preserving, promoting, and interpreting the heritage, art, and production of quilting and textiles in the southeastern United States. And really and truly, that's pretty, pretty heavy duty. Uh, we collect, as a matter of fact, we have not been able to collect until very, very recently because we didn't have really good storage space. Uh, it was off-site and it was very small, but the candy came through last year. Um, one of our board members managed to run the candy coroner out of his conference room, so we got his space. The coroner. The coroner. He didn't do his business there, I want you to understand. He just had a conference room. He never used it. So we got, we, we, we got rid of him. And then... Suddenly, there was a discussion with the candy about relocating other candy offices. The space that we occupy actually had to do with Ranger. office personnel who were sent to other locations because the candy courthouse was being renovated. So we inherited, really, that area. And then suddenly, they decided that we could no longer use a big storage area in the back. Of the, we're in an old cotton warehouse, a repurposed cotton warehouse. And so they had to give us more storage space. Air conditioned, air conditioned storage space. Nowadays, I have more storage space than I have exhibit space and I am thrilled to death. Yes, yes that's what a museum has to have. So nowadays, we are open for significant donations. Unfortunately, museums and archives are like all of us at home who don't rent storage buildings. We cannot keep everything, but we'd like to. However, there are significant donations that walk through the door. This quilt came in a pillowcase with four ladies from Florida who walked through our door one day and said, don't know if you'll be interested in this or not. The lady, who, the lady who received the gift practically fell on the floor, and I understand her blood sugar went crazy. She has one of those pump things, and it was going ding, ding, ding. 1834. And the maker's name is on the back. It doesn't get any better. Now, this quilt's got some problems, and we'll, we'll talk about those kinds of problems. This quilt was the other quilt that they had in the bag. It's even got a tag on it with the uh, maker's name. That's Julia, the mother. That's Maria, the daughter. That one, 1837. It, it, it makes you do that. It really does. This quilt is the Georgia Quilt Pencil. And we inherited that one. These it's, were rescue quilts in a way. Hmm? I think Actually, the, a lot of these were rescue quilts. They were given to us. As rescues. Uh, when we were putting the museum together mm -hmm. because families didn't want them. And the people who had them didn't want them sold after their death. 1830s probably. The pattern name is uh, uh, Wig's Defeat. Now, the wig in question was defeated in 1844. But you know, quilt names are funny. If you make a quilt, you can call it anything you want to. <laughs> but it's a fabulous quilt. It has wonderful chintz on it. I believe that the chintz borders on the Mariner's Compass and the carpenter's wheel are English chances. They look very much like John Hewson's fabrics. But I believe that that one is American. And wonderful to have both kinds. 
We have a wonderful collection of quilts that is part of that collection that was made by the Cotton Patch Quilters in Athens. It was hung in an exhibit in the state capitol in 2011. We have 55 quilts that we were given. They present a little bit of a problem because the ladies who made those understood that they were going to be sold to raise money to endow the museum. The problem is, given the events of uh, 2008, this is probably the worst time that could ever be to launch a museum. And so we fear that if we offer these wonderful quilts for auction, that they simply won't make the reserve. Um, I buy quilts on eBay that are significant for two and three hundred dollars. And there's far more fabric in that quilt and all the other ones we have. So we, have, we really have an ethical dilemma. What are we going to do? And um, I tried to do a little fundraising this morning, and the individual that I picked on didn't, she didn't respond. <laughs> now, we have quilts that are not suitable for display because they're in very poor condition. But for people like me who study quilts, if I've got a quilt that I can see the inside as well as the outside, I'm in heaven. It's heaven to have a tatty quilt. I don't care if they sting, and some of them do. But they're huge, they're very important. So when you're driving along the road and you stop at a yard sale, if there's a horrible tatty quilt, get it, get it. At this point in time, we have 14 quilts that we are studying and that are being considered for acquisition. There is no question. Here, there is no question on the table. Absolutely. The acquisitioning process is a really interesting one too. So part of our mission is ex exhibitions. We do four a year. Um, it's a real problem to get an exhibit that is significant, that draws attention and doesn't cost anything. Now that's one of our big issues is this doesn't cost anything business at this time. There are wonderful exhibits out there, but they're hugely expensive because of the transportation and for the insurance. We also like an exhibit to tell a story. Uh, we had a great exhibit this summer, this past summer. Uh, the poster is on the back wall, and I have a couple of those if anybody would like one for their sewing room. Um, we decided that we were going to commemorate the Battle of Atlanta. But everybody was out there with guns and loud noises and battles and whatnot, suffering. So we decided to focus on the girls that got left behind. There's a wonderful period Civil War song, The Girl I Left Behind Me. So we gathered up Civil War quilts that had a provenance. And it was enormously successful and the quilt that is featured on our poster, which is on the back wall, is the most stellar quilt that um, is at uh, the Bartow County Museum. So you see, this was another lovely partnership. We've got this nice thing going with Bartow County as well. Uh, our mission is not just quilts. It's textiles, fiber art as well. So uh, we're we're up for quilt guilds and other craft uh, organizations that uh, can write us a proposal and mount a good exhibit with a story. And we want to concentrate on the southeastern United States. Another mission is preservation. And <laughs> you guys haven't seen the big stack of acid-free boxes that I have hidden in the back, but that's what, how we store quilts and they have to be packed up in uh, acid-free tissue and we pad the folds and I have a lovely time because they have to be refolded every six months so I get to take them out and play with them. We have uh, to manage the temperature, the humidity and um, I have a constant fear that somebody will leave a half-eaten hamburger in the storage area and. I have to go, that's how I find them. 
When you're preserving something, there's a kind of an issue that are you going to preserve it or are you going to conserve it? And right now we are preserving, we are not conserving. But we've had this big discussion because a couple of ladies have asked me about this quilt. You will see that the brown fabric has somehow vanished. What has happened is that brown was created with a mordant, which is what fixes the color to the cotton. Cotton doesn't uh, dye well at all. And so the um, iron and alum, or aluminium, that was used to mordant that fabric is, is rusting. So we have to come up with a way to we have to come up with a way to deal with it, but replacing it, I don't think, is going to be an option. Um, terribly expensive thing to do, and um, I kind of like them like they are. I, I don't really want them fixed. I don't want them to be perfect. We also are documenting quilts with a description and a photograph. Yes, ma'am. If you preserve something, you keep it like it is. If you conserve it, then you fix it and make it perfect. And we're not, I, we're not currently trying to do that. I've got one, I have one dear lady who is dying to get her hands on this one. And I think she would do a good job. I truly do. So we also interpret. Um, we study. We try to identify time periods. But everybody knows, I think, in this room that dating quilts is a bit of a guessing game. It's a lot of fun, but it's a guessing game. Um, we try and learn about the processes and construction, which is why the taddy quilts are wonderful. We try to explain how items were used and really why they're in the state they're in. For example, the, the rusting chocolate fabrics. And the biggest thing of all is we want people to see them and we want people to enjoy them like I do. This is a couple of the um, volunteers from the museum who were uh, docenting the collection down at the Capitol in 2011. And this is our grand opening in 2012. And I want to recognize Mary Ross and Marilyn Ostercamp. I couldn't con Jane Kingsley into coming with me today. But these ladies did it, and the other people that were involved, these ladies did this. And I thank them very much, because I'm having fun. When we're interpreting, we also make quilts. We try to explain what we're doing to people. We show people what we're doing. And this past <laughs> summer, we had this great workshop with young, young people. And this little girl was so pleased with herself that she begged for a sewing machine for Christmas. I understand she got it, and then she wanted to be sure we were going to do it again next year. And we are. We are. We have a great gift shop, and there is nothing Chinese in there. <laughs> this is, these are all crafted items that are made and given to us or sold on consignment. And uh, we do very well with it. It was really amazing this past uh, fall. We had busloads of tourists. One busload was from Australia. Wow. One busload was kind of a mixture of European people. And they loved the gift shop. They really did. We made out like Chinese bandits. <laughs> and we need that. These are our valued community partners. Um, the microphone, the very 40s microphone, is the Public History Center at West Georgia. The uh, textile trail is something else we're involved with. They are trying to put together an interesting uh, itinerary all the way from Columbus, Georgia, up to Dalton, visiting different sites that are significant to uh, the textile industry. And hallelujah, we're right in the middle. It's wonderful. These are our current projects. Um, organizing our accessions committee. 
And if anybody can meet these qualifications and would be interested in looking at quilts online or on your computer and meeting in Carrollton once a year to discuss, we'd love to have you, we'd love to hear from you. I have a tablet down here. Sign up, we'll be in touch. We're also developing a quilt study center. We've been given 4,000 books. It's, they're amazing. It's a treasure trove. And in the pro we're in the process of cataloging. The idea being that we're not going to, I don't think, circulate the books because we don't really have enough people to do that. But people can come into the conference room, they can rummage through the books, they can make copies. If you're a member, you can make copies for free. And otherwise it's going to be a quarter of a page. And if you're not able to come to Karen, give us a call. We'll do the research and we'll send it to you for a fee. Right now, our business plan is an all-volunteer model, and it works. It, it's the classic uh, board of directors, volunteers. We do have one paid employee, but she, bless her heart, she's not making a fortune. Um, she is a, a graduate research assistant from the University of West Georgia, so she does get her tuition paid, and we actually have to reimburse the the center for her time, but she's enormously valuable because she's studying museum management. And then we have wonderful, wonderful volunteers. And the most fun thing about the museum, quite frankly, is the place is a circus most of the time. There's people coming and going and coming and sitting in the conference room and looking at books, and I don't get any work done when the museum's open, quite frankly. I'm having too much fun, and I never stop talking. We also are really working hard on attracting sponsors. Uh, we really need an endowment. That's, that's where we have to go. And um, you have to work at it, and we're working at it. In the future, um, the Quilt Study Center, hopefully the significant collection of quilts and textiles, um, there's talk in um, official circles that the cotton warehouse that we're in will be used to build out more office space for uh, county organizations that their building is being remodeled or they need to be re recited. And the theory is that uh, when all of that take, after all that takes place, we will get that space now. I'd a whole lot rather get the space, make it into a museum, and they can have my office, okay? That would be much better from my standpoint. But it needs to be purpose-built. Uh, the county is enormously supportive. They rent us our space for a dollar a year, and they pay our utility bills. They clean the bathroom, too, and that's nice. <laughs> so, when is the museum? like a quilt, when it's pieced together. And I want, I want to show you a quilt that is pieced together. And it's a very, very interesting pieced together quilt. It has what used to be called morning fabrics. Do you remember in Victorian times, the first year you were a widow, you wore black. After that, you wore gray. After that, you wore lavender. And then you could wear white. This quilt was made somewhere around 1890 in Cedartown, Georgia. Uh, we know the lady who made it. The family gave the quilt to us. This is going to be our first accession item. And I'm so proud to tell you that. She didn't have enough fabric to make the backing for her quilt, so she pieced it. And I believe that she pieced it from her dresses. And I think that this had to do with her father's death. Her, she was from Texas. She married a man uh, who uh, was from the Adairsville area. He was one of Joe Brown's pets. 
Joe Brown, during the Civil War, kept certain folks at home so that they could supervise agricultural stuff and gather supplies for the Confederate Army and that kind of thing. Well, in 1864, uh, once the Federal troops started to pour out of Chattanooga, Joe Brown had to kind of change his tactics. So he rounded up his pets and they all went in the, in, in, into the Army in one way or another. And this lady's husband was one of those. And the back of the quilt, or the front of the quilt, I don't, you know, either one, I probably would have had the red side up on my bed, but it's pieced of woolen clothing. And there's a really interesting possibility with the piece here. That used to be called Negro cloth and it was woven on the plantations for work clothes. It has a cotton warp and a wool weft, and it's twilled. It's enormously durable, but it probably wore like a hair shirt. I bet you itched really badly in this. But the man was a private, and he was a cavalryman. And I suspect that by 1864, this is pretty much all that was left to make a uniform out of. The Confederate uh, forces did not issue uniforms. You had to provide your uniform, your gun, and your horse. And so I think that's probably the truth about this quilt. But there is kind of a funny looking, really funny looking lavender gray fabric in there. And family think that that was his, the father's uniform. And I never did find him in the records, but he lived very close in Greenwood, Texas, to the Confederate hospital in Natchitoches. And I kind of suspect that the father probably worked there in some capacity. He was an older man, probably not fit for duty, for active duty, maybe. Um, but it's a great quilt. It's got a great story. That's the best part, it's the great story. This quilt is a different um, crazy quilt. I believe that this quilt was made for a Confederate veteran, and I think it's a presentation piece. I don't think it was really ever planned to be used. But it's a wonderful example. It's made about 1900, and, and we do know who made it. I have not been able to find much information, however which is kind of sad. But it does have the lovely purchased uh, components, which were kind of normal for that time of year. At uh, that time, um, people called those Japanese quilts as well. This is our little reception for our visitors from the UK and from Australia, uh, they were on a bus tour. They were going from Atlanta down to the quilt show in Houston. And we had a great time. I think they probably ate too much because everybody, and you know, in a southern town, when you bring something for a covered dish supper, it's always your best effort, not the worst, right? <laughs> oh man, there was some good stuff there but we all had enormous fun with this. Questions? Uh, for people of modest means and small homes, what's the best way to store these things and what's the best way to clean them or should you clean them? Do not clean them. <laughs> do not clean them. Store them flat on a bed. That's what they're intended to do. I probably have nine quilts on my spare room bed. I sort of have to do a hasty shuffle round if I have any company coming. <laughs> but don't clean them. Um, if you have a, a quilt that you really are using to sleep under, you can wash it in the bathtub with a, deter with a detergent that has no phosphates in it. When you do, Roll it, put it into the solution, and when you take it out of the solution, make sure you have your hands under it. 
and then dry it flat. I use a very large car trailer to dry mine on. Because I can park it in the shade, I can cover it with, I just have, I have a big chunk of, of nylon netting so the cats don't get on it. And that's how I dry a quilt. Because the important thing is to dry it. But don't. Don't, don't put it in the washing machine. Definitely don't put it in the dryer. But don't. More questions? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, let's, let's, um, uh, is there any effort to hand stretch the shrinkage of the thread? I kind of ease it. I don't put it on a frame or anything like that. You got some ideas, Marilyn? It's usually not thread, it's usually that. Yeah, gently, 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 kind of just, you know, spread it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's very easy to pop the the uh, threads, and when that happens, of course, then you have a really horrible raveling pro uh, problem. But normally they were built. I mean, that's you're going to have yeah. a five percent. You hope that less than five percent. Yeah, of course. You know, of course, very old quilts that are hundred percent cotton. They've they've probably gone ahead and shrunk as much as they're going to shrink. And natural shrink, and that's new. So. Yeah, I pre-shrink everything that I use to quilt with. I wash everything. And my buddies from South Georgia are busy going, I can't believe you do that. And I said, well, that's what they make spray starch for. Yes, ma'am. What is the story of the quilt behind you? Oh, the plot of it. The 1870s, Columbus, Georgia. We know the family who gave us this one. This again, George Cook. Yeah, yeah. And the, this quilt and the, um, we have a, another quilt that, that um, came from the same source. And uh, just wonderful, just wonderful. I, I, I have a picture of the lady that made this. It's got its problems too. If you look closely, you'll see that um, the brown is giving way. And in fact, I tried to um, mend a quilt that I have at home. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Use netting. <laughs> and um, one, one of the, it's, it's a, a foundation piece to, uh, uh, quilt, and it's probably clothing. Anyway, it, it, one little piece that had brown and white stripes, the stripe went. So I tried to over sew it. In the end, what I did was I took a photograph of the quilt and I put it onto my computer and I made a pattern and then I ran a piece of 100% cotton fabric that is bonded to a, a, a stiff backing and I printed it. And then I cut my little piece out and I put it in there. Wow. Yes, but I've saved the piece. Yes, I've saved the piece. And better yet, that quilt had newspaper on the back of it. And the newspaper was really in a horrible state. And I took it off. Marilyn's going to croak now. I took it off. You took the backing off. I took the newspaper off. Well, okay. That's what you should have done. Should have done that at the well, but I've saved it. Yeah. I laid it on the on the the copier, and I copied every one of them. And when I took them off, I got a date, which was 1913. It was an Atlanta Journal that they had snipped up to make the foundation. I even got the address and name of the individual who received the newspaper. Now. What that had to do with the quilt, I don't really know. And they were living on the same street that I live on in Winston, Georgia. Who knew? Yes, ma'am? Well, my mother in law just died. She was 97, and there was a cedar chest full, full of quilts. Full of tops, not quilted, just the top, rolled up, 
grandmother's flower mark. I can't tell you how many of the double wedding rings. How wonderful. And the newspaper where they used to cut up the pens had the Chattanooga Times with the, uh, uh, like the, the, the futures for pork bellies and stuff. <laughs> wow. What am I supposed to do with the talks? What do you want to do with them? Well, if they had to be quilted, I don't want somebody, I, I think they should match the era. Machine quilting was in. Was machine quilting was there in that era. And if I find a good long armor, shall I? You might think about it. Sewing machines were not common in 1850. They cost about five hundred dollars in they that kind they, of. They were thrilled to have them. Oh, but they had them. Yeah. And you know the the feed sacks. Feed sacks are not 1940 only. Fancy feed sacks in 1940, and there were lots of them. And you know, back in that day and time, that's what your underwear came from, generally speaking. But feed sacks were, and flour sacks, and coffee sacks, and whatnot sacks were common in by the 1860s, and they were chain stitched. I mean, to hand it, to handle 100 pounds of feed, they'd be pretty hefty, right? So. Your your question about should I long arm it? Yeah, if you, if you want the if you want to be able to use them or display them, but let me caution you that old quilt tops sometimes are very brittle, and that one I repaired is a good case in point. I don't think I can use it as a bed covering. I think it's going to become a wall covering on my staircase, but I'm happy with that. I had another question. I was going to say, comment about having it in the cedar chest. Well. Where the wood touches the cloth. Well, not good. Not good. Well, they were also in, um, what did you say earlier, the old Yeah, no. A pe- perfect, then. <laughs> well, the only, the only problem I've got with storing a quilt in a pillowcase, it's great to take it wherever it is you're taking it. In fact, this one arrived in a piece of red fabric because it's so big. That quilt is 110 inches because in the 1800s, beds were that big. Everybody got in the same bed. So, you know, but spread, if they're flat, they're better. But if you've got your quilts in a cedar chest, just make sure that the cedar chest doesn't touch your quilt. Let it touch something else. Acid-free tissue is the, what the museums use and it's horrendously expensive and, and quite it, hard to get hold of. And it has a short life. And it doesn't last very long, so yeah. So. Uh, garland, is that garland disguise? Yeah, yeah. So, save your old sheets, launder them in a non-phosphate detergent, and go for it. Go buy muslin at, uh, you know, Michael's or Hobby Lobby or, you know, one of those places. It's cheaper than acid-free and it works just as well. Just if you're going to fold them, just put a pad into the fold so that the fold is is supported, and refold every six months. That gives you a chance to play with your quilt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, I was wondering about the value of a machine-made quilt versus a hand quilt, and I know it seems like a lot of people do machine uh, sewing machine quilts now. They but do. I would, I would think that the hand sewing would be. If the quilting's good. If the quilting's good. So but the machine quilts, you don't have a... I don't have if any you, problem if with If you it. look at the back, if you want to, I'll show you the back of the one back there. That's and machine. And that's machine quilt. Yeah, yes. You'll see how beautiful the stitching yes. you, you know, sometimes you're thinking of machine quilts similar to the stuff you get at Walmart where they just go boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom. There are machine quilters who quilt in small areas. And so their works of art in itself. In themselves. There's nothing Just wrong with that. Like I like, like hand quilting art. because I like hand quilting. You know, but you know, wait, yeah, and just wait until you go f- talk to a long arm machine person and find out what it costs. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with machine quilting. And any it quilts after 1860, a lot of them have machine work in them. Nothing wrong with that. They're not as valuable, but it yes, all depends on condition. It depends on condition. If you have a really tatty quilt that's hand quilted and you have a fabulous one over there, 
that is machine quilted, chances are the really well made one, the really well crafted one, where the colours are nice, chances are it's going to be worth more. Tell them what AQS pays for their quilts. <laughs> AQS ha- is probably one of the premier places. The American Quilt Society has a show every April. Their best of show, it's a purchase award. They pay $20,000 for the quilts. And I know for sure that the last five, six, seven of them definitely have all been machine quilted. And those quilters are out of this world. Some of the work is amazing. So it doesn't matter, hand or otherwise. Really does with hand quilting, we are losing that art. Right. And it's, and it's tedious, and it's time consuming. And believe me, in Georgia, trying to hand quilt with a quilt in your lap in the summer, it's <laughs> not as much fun as you might think it might be. Particularly if it's a wool quilt. <laughs> I, I tried quilting, you know, it's probably 20 years ago, I made a quilt top, and I was so determined I was going to do it by hand, because that would make it more valuable, and I think now, if I had just used the sewing machine, you know, I could have done it. <coughs> yeah. I'm just really I, surprised to hear that. I have a buddy. In, in Carrollton, and she's just got a long arm machine. She's a wild woman anyway. She did 16 quilts from June the 1st until July 13th. Margot Perkins. Crazy Margot. Well, she makes fabulous quilts. She does. But and I'm assuming this long arm machine is a special sewing machine made for quilting. Well, it, it, it is. It, hers is one of the new computer. Uh, guided ones and it takes some of the art out of it to, no. me, to me. No. You still got to set it up. Yeah. A long arm, normally you have the quilt on a frame and the long arm just is longer from the back of the machine to the to the needle. Yeah. No, our machines have about this much room. A long arm has about this much room. But they're hand guided. You're right up here and you see the needle. You can make the tiniest wonderful stitches with it. You know, and you have to have control. I know, I know, you know, there are those who just turn it on and let it go, but there's also those people who, again, follow the pattern that you have in front of you. It's um, amazing. We had a, a, a speaker, Cotton Patch, and she's a very talented young quilter who looks for different ways to put things together. She loves buying old quilt tops to see how earlier quilters pieced things. And, you know, so that, and sometimes earlier quilters did it in a much easier fashion than we do it. Sometimes we make it harder. And so she showed us one, and she says, I'm interested in this, and she liked the color. She said, I'm going to go have it quilted. And someone said, oh, you're going to have it quilted? She says, oh, I can't do that. I've given that up. I'll have a machine quilted. And everybody went, oh. And she said, no. Then it's quilted, hand or machine. It will live again. Now, the quilter who put it together wanted it to be a quilt. Machine quilting it is just fine. Yeah. So it's what you want to do with it. Mm-hmm. If you're satisfied with keeping it as an unfinished top, fine. You can also make it into what's considered a southern quilt. I have one where it really just much has border and a bat. There's no quilting because southern quilts they didn't put bat in it for the summer. It was a summer, southern summer quilt. What about tying it, Marilyn? That's another that. whole thing. You can tie quilts. Mm-hmm. Just to hold things together. So. Lots of possibilities. More yeah. questions? Yes, sir. You've inherited several quilts and a lot of lace. Oh. They're all on the white background. Oh. And the white background is becoming dominant. Is there a way to preserve those or come to preserve those? Well, you can. Um, the, you, you're really and truly, are you going to use lace? Right, but would you really? Do you wear lace? People don't wear lace. I have a huge. Well, <laughs> I have a huge lace collection, but quite frankly, I would preserve it. I wouldn't attempt to conserve it. I wouldn't take anything apart. I would just roll it up and keep it. And Is there a way of de yellowing? Yeah, it's called oxygen. People used to put their linens out in the sun, yeah. Oxygen bleach does the same thing, but oxygen bleach is very, very um, tough on, your, on an old fabric. Yes, ma'am? There's a lot of 
money he tells about cleaning and storing at home that supplement and, and guide the, and the bare minimum information you were able to give on the stage. Is there any written material available mm -hmm. for the home for, for person? Yeah. Are, you, are, you, are, you, are you computer savvy? Well, I'm asking a general question. I, sorry, I happen to know from academic yeah. study. Yeah, there's lots of stuff. There is a lot of stuff out on the internet. I would be sure that it's put out with, by somebody who has some um, credentials and uh, uh, not not just something off of YouTube. But um, yeah, there's a there's a tremendous amount, and this whole thing is a big it's a big area in museum studies how to do this and the right way to do this and and so on. But yes, ma'am. But really and truly. The, the internet. <laughs> okay, can I ask the second question? Certainly. Okay, your storage facility with the air condition and humidity control, is it, is it really state of the art or is it just ordinary air conditioning? It's ordinary air conditioning, but we do monitor it. I, I, yeah, I definitely wish we had a laminar airflow system and, I, I, yeah, absolutely, but... Uh, when we get, yeah, we get our first million. We'll we'll definitely do that. And um, right now, I'm happy to have it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What's the oldest book in the collection of the museum? Probably me, my wonderful, fragile Brodery Pest quilt that a lady walked in with. She had this dreadful looking box from a department store in Rome and it was kind of greasy and funny looking. She says to me, um, I don't really know what to do this. Do you think the museum would be interested? Because again, you know, I fell in the floor because it looks like 1800. It's in dreadful state. It has the most fabulous china blue and buff chintz border but it's in sad shape. I do not dare even unfold it. I unfolded it once and photographed it, and I put it in a box, and I do not dare open it again. The earliest quilt that is uh, known is one out of an Egyptian tomb that is still intact. There is another one that really, it, it, it's described as a carpet, but I, I don't know, how, how would you distinguish between a carpet and a quilt in a Chinese tomb from a long, really long time ago? So there are really old ones out there. There's a 1300 one in Sicily. The oldest one that I know of in England is 1705. It's a silk quilt. It's marvelous, just marvelous. It's pieced. That one's pieced. Now there are whole the whole cloth quilts were kind of what you typically had in the 1700s, 16 and 1700s. 1600s in America, there's not any much evidence that there were patchwork quilts then. Um, most of the bed covers that have survived have been whole cloth quilted. A lot of them were wool whole cloth quilted. <coughs> And there's some fabulous examples of those. Uh, but this business of patchwork really um, doesn't happen until the 19, well, late 1790s into the 1800s. Yeah. Well, women, the, the chintz was so appallingly expensive. There is a wonderful story about Abigail Adams, who had the poor taste to get out in Washington at some point and tell her friends that she had spent six dollars a yard on muslin for a cap. Don't you imagine that there was all sorts of discussion on Capitol Hill? Abigail really needed to keep quiet about that. I mean, seriously. I mean, in those days, people made pennies a week, you know. But the chintz fabrics that were imported were fabulously expensive, and most women in very early America had children to raise, they were constantly pregnant, they had to help in the field, they had to help in the farm, they were midwives. I don't think they were quilting, I truly don't, and there's no evidence much that they did. But they used those whole cloth covers, and they used something that they called tufted, that I imagine to be something like a carpet. 
I mean, New England winters are pretty cold, and a, a quilt would be nice, but pretty much they used woolen covers. I believe that we need to break off and have a little uh, uh, time to walk around and refresh, and I think we have a two o'clock date. It's been lovely to see you, and I've enjoyed myself so much, and I do hope that you will come and visit us in Carrollton. We are open on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 10 until 4, and if that doesn't suit your group, give me a call, because I have the keys. I'll open for you. Thank you. Obviously these are clothing, and she cut them all the same size, and stored them, and she put this together. These are kind of like bricks, but it's true, I mean you can see the fabric she's used for all the different things that she's made. Now even, even in the borders, she chose really interesting colors. Well, now that's an interesting way of doing that. I, I have it draped over a deacon's bench in my hall, and so I don't put it on the bed. I take it out once every couple of years to sun it, but other than that, and I vacuum it with Maybe they even put a new, because doesn't this look newer? Maybe they put a new back on it, that's my guess. Right, and my mother might have to put that on because she wanted to hang, it's hanging in her dining room. fabulous. Very, very nice. Like the back of the now, I have to say, we, we use it every day. Should we, should we not? Or does it just. I think it's your decision. I mean, you don't want to have the cook left in pristine condition and you're gone. Yeah. So, yeah. 